Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on Run Space Workflows. Parallelize your code one step at a time. Very big surprise. We're going to be talking about parallelization here quite a bit. I'm Fred, Cloud Solution Architect at Microsoft, where I'm doing security automation and other automation and more, well, mostly PowerShell for the company. You can reach out to me even after this conference, best reached under the PowerShell Discord named Fred. I'm a mostly silent observer, best if you ping me. Usually I hang out in the PS Framework channel, but well, um, yeah, just reach out to me at any time. I'm always happy to talk about all kinds of things, mostly PowerShell, especially in particular when it comes to bragging about my toys, which is, well, a professional risk when you encounter me at any place in the world. Other than my bed, but that's a different story, and we would be having some other words on that topic. Um, this uh, session is uh, going to involve quite a bit of set toys, specifically PS Framework. So this is the link list you might want to do a quick photo of if you want to be sure you can follow up on everything. All the presentation materials will go live a few minutes after this talk. So if you want the demos to play around with what you were seeing, that's where you can grab them under my GitHub repository. P224 dash PowerShell Summit dash uh, run spaces. So, yeah, what are we going to talk about? First of all, I always like to give some context and establish the problem that we're trying to solve. So, we will be looking at the different patterns how we parallelize in PowerShell. Some of them are going to be rather well-known patterns. Some of them might be surprises you didn't think about before. We'll find out. And most notably, we will point at a major problem that I'm trying to solve. Then we are going to solve it. And we're going to do it without any dependencies, none of Fred to Fred's toys involved. Something you can do and just plugs in somewhere because as much as I dislike that part, but it is just a reality. Not everybody can always just grab the latest huge kit of toys from Fred and use them. There's the security thing. They want some review. Maybe there's an organiza organizational process that says, first, you need to get an approval process that cannot possibly be completed. Sometimes we just get a, no, you can't. So we will try to solve this problem as best we can just with the built-in PowerShell tools. And once you fully grasp and realize what kind of pain is involved with that, I'm going to be bragging about some of my toys. All right, parallelization. What are the usual patterns that we're seeing? One of the greatest and simplest one is inline expansion. Let's say I have a set of commands I pipe from one to the other. And if I now want to parallelize one of those steps, that is fairly simple since we have PowerShell 7, because this is more or less the domain of for each object dash parallel. It's simple, it was not optimized code, just a simple proof of concept here. But this allows us to, well, parallelize one step in the pipeline. The key advantage here really is it is absolutely simple. It's as easy as parallelization gets. There are open source modules that provide that feature also in Windows PowerShell if you can't go to PowerShell 7. So yeah, can be done, it's fairly easy. There's just one major problem here and that is uh, while it is simple to use, it is very hard to fully define the context and provide resources and plan out the whole thing. Like the number of controls we can tweak is very limited in the setup. Also, it only works inline in the pipeline, so it must be done by the end of the pipeline. And sometimes fire and forget and fire or fire and come back later is a feature we would like, and inline expansion does not offer that. Which is, uh, well, let me go jobbing. Let's say I've got a server I want to run a script against. Simple enough, just like one task sequence that I'm doing. And if I now have 100 servers, I run the script 100 times in parallel and wait until I'm done. And if I've got a management solution, something a bit more complex set up, well, I can do something before and after. 
and just tie that whole thing into the workflow. This is still simple enough to set up. We have posh RS job, we have start threads job as a built-in feature in PowerShell 7. And let's be honest, putting together a quick custom run space uh, setup is well enough documented. We have a dedicated session on that. I think it was yesterday. So um, setting up some run spaces is something we can do quick enough to get the same effect. So far, that's nice. This, however, has usually one problem, and that is for the entire sequence of that job. Uh, well, that is one thread running in parallel. And there might be some problem with that. We'll be coming back in a little bit when you come to the problem description, because this is what we're going to be expanding upon. But before we do that, let's talk about the Highlander run space scenario. Um, let me assume I've got a module, and there's something I want to have it running in the background. So I spin up a run space that's just going to do its thing behind the scenes. This can work really well until somebody takes my module and also sends it in multiple run spaces, because now each of them is going to spin up one of those background run spaces. Now imagine that background run space we're, we're implementing later gets an update where it uses the module that is spinning up the run space. Oh, we've got an infinite loop of run spaces being spawned. Um, yeah, so we have a scenario where we want to have a unique run space per process that cannot be duplicated. We can try to solve this by looking for a run space name. We can name run spaces starting PowerShell 5. And I dearly hope none of you needs to go back to older versions. Um, I know some of you still will anyway. Sorry, my apologies, my condolences on that point. Still, um, we, we can look for the name, but that still has us the race condition. What if we spin up multiple run spaces at the same time and they do the check in parallel? All of them don't find that run space yet and then decide to create that run space. The name is a decoration. I can have multiple run spaces of the same name. So there is some problems to be solved here. We are not going to be talking about that particular scenario, but if you ever need that kind of capability, PS Framework does have that, mostly because I needed it for my own logging, otherwise we would have that, oh, I'm trying to access the same file twice in parallel problem. So that's how that works. We can then submit data to that as one of those scenarios, or what could we use for a background run space for? For example, we could be using it as a cache refresher. So the background run space keeps data in a cache up to date, and the main run space directly access that data for ease of access and no delay. That's, for example, something happening in DBA tools to provide um, up-to-date tab completion. We don't want people to have to wait for that, but uh, we also want to have some control over that. So in DBA tools, there's a background run space handling uh, the cache refresh. Another thing we could be doing is sending workload tasks and then have the, the unique main run space act as a task scheduler kind of thing, which incidentally is the other pattern that I occasionally encounter. Where the we have a task manager run space that is supposed to be a unique run space and other run spaces submit tasks to happen whenever we want to do it, either on a schedule or I've got a main run space that wants to clear out some temp data. I've got a module that needs to uh, purge some temp things. I don't care exactly when that happens. I don't want to wait for it to complete because it might take some time. So I'm going to just, well, throw this to some job manager for me so I don't need to implement my own full, well, run space thread just for that. So we could have some criteria, some scheduler, and some prioritization. Who? is one time. There's a lot more effort we could invest in that scenario. If you ever have a need for something like that, again, PS Framework does have something here. I must admit one of the more underutilized features. So I mentioned the problem. I've got this nice script that I want to parallelize. The problem is now 
this script is necessary, not necessarily something I want to run against hundreds of servers. And this script, um, well, actually, it is composed of several different tasks that I, or steps that I take within that script. Now, what happens if I have different parallelization requirements for each individual step? Let's say I can do the first thing three times in parallel before I'm being throttled to death by the API. Now the next one has a lot more capability. I could do this 10 times in parallel, and each step here is taking a lot more time per item than the, free, uh, than the step before. So having that scale up to more parallel executions would be beneficial. The next one can only be done once. Then we have one with maybe where five times in parallel can, could be a thing. So each step could have different requirements here, also different requirements for the context we need to provide, the resources, the tools. And, well, we could be doing eight separate jobs here and have them have more different throttling limits. That would work. Now, there is one problem. Let's assume our step two, which you do 10 times in parallel, usually is safe to run 10, 10 times in parallel. But depending on what input it receives and in what format, it needs to do more requests per items, and suddenly we run into throttling. Now we have a need to coordinate those 10 jobs that are running in parallel. We have a need to coordinate between them so they don't actually run into that problem. Or let's say I have step four. With step four, I'm trying to do some graph API calls. And in order to avoid throttling here, because this is a particular nasty API subset of that, I want to use different accounts for each of those five run spaces. So I've got separate accounts, even though they're basically doing the same thing. So I need to provide different values for that. And then there's this last problem. When we have the traditional job set up, we have to wait for a job to complete to collect the results. Now let's say one of our jobs is an exchange uh, is get mailbox from Exchange Online. This is perfectly safe to run in an environment with a thousand mailbox mailboxes. Now assume we have a million mailboxes. At some point there's this nice, friendly, red colored text going to show up out of memory exception. Or your infrastructure team is going to have some nasty words for you if you're asking for that particular mega server to be able to run the script. So we actually would like to have a capability to pass data through these steps before the job completes. Which is going to lead to a few interesting questions. For example, how will any individual step ever know that it is completed, that there's no more data coming in. It's a background run space basically waiting for the next item input. And is the step before that just slow and something is coming in? I mean, the step before might have been throttled to wait for three seconds. Three seconds can be an eternity. So how does any step know, OK, I'm done? So there's going to be some problems here. Let's take a look at the tech side. So, all right, Mouse, it's your turn. Ah, there it is. So, we have, oh, yeah, thank you. That makes it a lot easier if you actually are able to see something. So we have some, I have some preparation here, a custom invoke run space command. We are not going to be investigating the code. That's a few hundred lines of script that don't fundamentally change the way we, uh, what we are talking about here. It's a way to, well, set up run space actions happening and provide context. As mentioned, we have a session about that. You will ha have access to all of that code to look that up. Just trust me, it's going to run script logs in parallel in a background run space. From a fundamental de design perspective, how do we create run spaces? 
well, we start with an initial session state. What the hell is my run space supposed to be able to have access to? What commands, what modules? Then we add more contents here, like custom variables. Come on, there we go. Functions or modules or whatever else we want to pre-provide. Then we define a run space pool that basically handles our throttling, how many executions do we have in parallel. We define run spaces, as many as we want, assign them to the pool and kick them off, and at some point we just have to wait until they're done and collect them. It's a bit nasty, very .NET type heavy code, so feel free to investigate that. We'll have that covered for you for now. There is also a pretty good blog post I still like to reference for setting up my first um, run space from Chris Ilimer. It's from the year 2016, but it still works the same way today. So if you want a more guided tour on how to set it up rather than looking at thread code, which is admittedly not heavy on comments, you can go there. So let's do the first thing. In order to make this properly work, we want to exchange data with queues. Q is a kind of array or collection where the first item that was inserted into it is the first item that is taken out of it. So when one step in our pipeline provides output, we write that to that queue, and the next step would then read that from the queue. For that first, we have here uh, one problem that we need to solve, and that is the get mailbox conundrum. Get mailbox will return all of the mailboxes, but if we wait for it to complete, our memory is going to burst, or at least we have to assume it's going to happen. So what I do here is a quick demo on how we can catch that by using a command that is going to return whatever number of items I want, and it's going to wait one second in between to simulate a long running command that keeps outputting some data. The second command to showcase the whole thing is write input which is taking input from the pipeline and then just writing it on screen, which is going to show when exactly it received that item. So, as we can see here, the second command in the pipeline did not wait the full five seconds for the items, it wrote it one message per second. In a PowerShell pipeline, a command one sends to command two an object. Like here, we, have, we produce output. At this point, the process step, or the current step in the, this command is going to be on hold until every command afterwards in the pipeline is done. And then, only then it's going to continue. So, if we now instead of write input, have a for each object and add that item to a queue, we are adding mailboxes to that queue as they arrive rather than having to wait for the command to complete or whatever else slow gathering command API request we're doing. So we need the next construct, which is a queue. As mentioned, first in, first out. We have different types of queues in PowerShell in .NET. We are accessing the .NET uh, types for that, and there's a namespace called concurrent, which is intended to be thread safe. So it, we don't have any conflict with one or multiple threads or run spaces, adding data or removing data. So let's add that. To add an item to it, we just use the NQ method. They're now in there. And to remove an item, we need to do try the queue. This is a bit of an annoyance because we first need to declare a variable to be filled in. And once we have that, we can use that with the ref typecast, which means that method call is now going to fill in the, the content of the dollar result variable. So this is not actually an input, it's only a dot, uh, it's a .NET method call that has two outputs. Because what it also does, it returns $true, whether something was successfully dequeued 
or a false if not so. Otherwise, we would have trouble figuring out the difference between there was a null value in the queue or there was nothing in the queue. So we now have here the value number one. If we now dequeue the next item, we have here value number two. And now there's nothing more to dequeue, so we get a return value of false. And the result has also been cleared. By dequeuing an item, it's not only read, it's also removed from the queue. So, let's create a new concurrent queue. And I'm now going to invoke run space with providing the variable of the queue, the processing queue. I'm also going to provide the function get data slowly. Throttle one. So only one run space in parallel, and the invoke run space expects at least one uh, expects um, input, and for each of that, it's going to try to set up a run space. Since we only have one, have one long running run space, which is going to do 30 times get data slowly, and then add that to the queue, we only we ignore the original input actually, so that's okay. So get that started. Start that job. And the second job is also receiving the same parameters, the same queue, and is going to try to dequeue an item, and it's going to wait until done. It also knows, hard coded here, that we expect a total of 30 items, so it knows when to stop. And then we finally produce the result. Fire. We now have two separate jobs. And some, at some moment there was one item in there, but the pick up, run, the next second step run space is picking it up immediately since it is faster and pro at processing data than the first job is at generating data. And if we're done, we can just wait for it to complete. And once that method call is done, the job has completed. The second one returns actual output. So it's all there, and we have all the items that the first, second one produced. And that is how we well were able to pass through information from one to the other. Now this has obviously a major problem right now. We need to know ahead of time how many items. Otherwise the second job would never have known I'm done. I need to do something. So, how can we solve that? So, the first thing we can do is we can declare we are done. There is also a nice thing called a concurrent dictionary. It, that's basically a hash table only. It is able to, uh, well, have act, read and write in parallel. So, let's do that. And we can basically use it the same as we would a hash table. So, we set up one of those as our status flag, like this is our currently current processing state. We have again the queue for the input output for tra data transfer. And we now provide both variables to the tasks. So now status is going to say, I'm good, once they're done. Once this task is completed, it's going to set this flag. We're good. And the second one is going to continue until the status.input has been set, and then it's going to break. Since this only happens when it fails to dequeue an item, it is still going to uh, process the last item we queued before that. So we don't have really a risk of missing out anything. So job one, job two, they're still as boring as ever. 
still getting sometimes items. And we can now wait for that to complete. And they actually completed successfully. Otherwise, it would have hung until done. So that's nice when we are able to actually correctly have a status flag like this. Problem here is, um, well, sometimes we still need to have some processing capability, some ability to count how many items were processed and pass that on. And for that, we need a thread safe way to update a count. You know about, I've got this number. I'm going to increment that. Fred, do the spelling correct. And if I now access that, plus one. Problem is, that this default incrementing is not thread safe. There's an annoying way to do this in C Sharp, which is why we have about 20 lines of C Sharp code in here that implements the type for us. So I'm going to dump a large set of random numbers in this command. We are going to set up queues to exchange information. We also have a final result queue, status transfer, and an incremental that we're creating. And of that, we just pass through some parameters to our run space. Now, here's the thing. I managed to mess that one up, accidentally hitting that part. All right. We are now invoking the first run space and three times in parallel, but we don't even know how many that's going to be. There's no way we can say, okay, I am done because each individual task, uh, task action in there doesn't know whether it's the last one. So we instead increment by one. And the second job is going to, well, it's going to try for some done, uh, some done, but the status doesn't, there's, the first step isn't going to update the status to done. Instead, what's going to happen at the bottom, once we kick those two off, is we first collect the first step until it's done. We know when it's done because that is going to end once all the items are being processed. And while our increment account is greater than, the, than that count, we are waiting. And once this is completed, we now know that all the items in, um, in the final result queue that the second step produced have the exact same count as the first, uh, first step was actually incrementing. So it has now pro processed all the input from the first step. So we can now set this to true, collect the job, which is going to happen immediately, and our results correctly reflect this from processing perspective. Which leaves us the next problem, throttling. How the hell do we throttling across multiple run spaces? Well, uh, we have uh, a few lines of C-sharp code that we're not going to go into here, but they will compile without dependency. It creates a throttle object, which we can then add a limit how many executions per time Um, did I mess that one up? Yes, I did mess that one up. No. Okay, I create a set a limit three times per 10 seconds. And whenever I now call the get slot method, it is going to increment the count of slots. And once we hit the limit, it is going to wait until the first ones have expired. And you can call that from multiple run spaces. We can also add a second limit, in which case both limits apply. No more than two calls per five seconds and no more than three calls per 10 seconds. Now we have to wait on the third call already. And after about five-ish seconds, including the delay 
before that, we get the third slot. Now we run into the second limit and we're good. We can also do a hard timeout on this thing. Like sometimes if a REST API that calls says, hey, wait for 10 seconds before you call me again. And with this not before call, we can define that. And now it's going to wait five the full seconds until we're done. All right, we can provide that to a background run space as a variable, same as all the others. And then have that executed and call throttle.getSlot on each time we do that. Here's a new one parameter. If we specify the wait parameter, invoke run space is going to block until it's done and then result the results at the same time. So it's basically the same as the calling the dot collect method immediately. Yeah. There we are. And we can see the time jumps between start and end when we hit the throttling limits. So that was respected. Okay. This is how far I'm planning on going with doing, doing the custom part. There are a few more considerations. You can look that up in the docs. I've got more ex examples to run through things. But uh, you know how it is. Um, I can't really end a talk without breaking about my toys. So we're now getting to the uh, part where we get the comfortable features and don't have to do it all ourselves with some finicky well, manual creation. All right, what we need for that really? PS Framework module, which implements the whole thing. This feature, amongst many others, is properly documented. And I totally did not forget during my prep to implement, uh, uh, input the actual link to the specific run space workflow documentation that we're about to see. But it has a landing page under documentation, PS Framework documents, run space workflows. So fundamentally, run space workflows have three components. We have the overall workflow, which is basically all of the things, with, uh, the, the entire timeline we saw before with the individual steps. We have workers, which is the one step in the workflow that we're defining, where we can say, like, do this five times in parallel, do the throttling, do whatever we needed to do. And we have automatic queue management, so we don't have to worry about that. It's doing that for us. So let's set up a basic workflow. I create a new workflow object, which is the container where everything goes in. Once I have that, I add workers to it. The first one is going to um, take whatever input I define as input by the name. And the result objects are going to end up in the queue named processed. This is going to work as the input for the second worker, which is going to write the results into the done queue. The first step is going to happen three times in parallel. The second is going to happen two times in parallel. The input that we will provide later is dollar underscore within the script block, and it's going to be created here. Process is going to have the value times two, and finally we'll be updating the result with multiplying against by three in the second step. Simple mathematics going on here. Nothing particularly weird, I hope. Then we add the values. At this time, nothing has happened yet. Nothing has started. We're now adding 10,000 uh, numbers as input to the input queue on the workflow. And then we start it. We can wait for it until the queue done has 1,000 items, and then we clean up so the run spaces don't linger around after we don't no longer need them. Since we don't have any throttling in there, this just ran through and was done, since doing simple in-memory number processing is quite fast. We can then use read PSF run space queue to get the result that's in, the, that's in that queue. We can, however, also take a look at the workflow object. We can see what queues exist and what's the how many items are in there. 
collect that. Finally, clean up the entire run space workflow. We need to do the remove step also, even though we already stopped the, uh, the run spaces because uh, PS Framework is going to cache all the run space workflows in memory until the final removal is done in case we forget about storing that in a variable. Otherwise, we would have no mechanism to terminate the run spaces if we forget to handle that. So we also have this final removal step necessary. And that's the result. Got a thousand results and the numbers are correct mathematically. As usual, when we do work with run spaces, the order of return value return value is not guaranteed. So that's okay. We are, however, back at the position where we need to know the numbers. And that's a bit of a problem. So what we have here is a concept of closing a queue. When we know that nothing is ever going to happen to that queue anymore. And with that, we can declare this is done. So I create a new workflow, and I add to the input queue 1,000 items, and I'm telling it, you're done. Nothing is ever going to be added anymore to the input queue. And now, we do the same thing again. There's a bit of a sleep involved here. But close out queue. The worker is going to launch 1,000 times, or it's going to keep launching items here until it no longer has any item in the input queue. And then it's not going to sleep because it know, it can know through that line that there's never going to be one more input. So once it has done its final task, it can state, OK, I am done. I will never, ever get another task to do. So it can then go ahead and continue this I'm closing a queue thing to the next step and close its out queue because it is never going to write anything anymore to that queue because it's done. It will no longer receive any, in receive any input. And the same we can do with subsequent workflows and workers. This one is also going to close its out queue when it's done, which is the done queue. And now, we can simply wait until the result queue has been closed, or the worker name result has closed its out queue. And unless I messed up my demo, we now have all the items. Demo gods, thank you. OK, now this uh, should have been fast. The code and I will have a conversation after this one. <laughs> so, so far, so simple. Just getting something done and flagging it as it's completed or it's not completed. Um, Watching for that and hopefully not encountering one of those. Uh, worked all the time until I'm trying to present, present it, the issues. Um, how can we provide resources here? That is mostly rather simple. I define a new workflow. I provide a variables hash table and pass that in as variables. It's otherwise exactly the same code. So I'm not going to have us run through that too fast or too long. We're going to kick it off, wait until it's completed. And clean up everything, and there's our results. Again, order somewhat questionable, but otherwise it worked. If we want variables per run space that differ depending on which run space we're working in, it works pretty much exactly the same thing. It's only that we are providing the variables hash table to the var per run space parameter meter rather than the variables parameter. The individual variable multiplier should have as many items in there as an array as we have um, threads that are working in parallel. If we have less than that, the last uh, workers that grab their item are going to get a null value 
which is probably not going to lead to very mathematically correct multiplication. If you have more than that, any extra values are going to be ignored. But otherwise, it's the exact same thing. So we are now going to multiply, doing the math here to demonstrate that part. And 20 values, run it and wait. And once we're done, and collect the info and remove the run space, we should theoretically have had something here. Okay. <sighs> Demo gods. Um, why did I mess that one up? Workflow object, no results at all. We're producing the item, however. It also was too fast for that, actually. Let's try the whole thing in one go again. Now we have a wait period that is appropriate. And now we have the results. I probably forgot to actually add the worker. <laughs> so there was nothing to wait for. Mm -hmm. So, so far for adding variables, there is a bit more complicated issue, and that is adding functions, commands. If you're adding that to the background run space, we need to provide the variable, of the command, of course, get random number. And we now need to provide the code to it. It is, again, a hash table. Expects on the left side a string. On the right side, it expects now the source code. Problem here is the way I'm doing this, I'm just giving it the code as a string. And this code is going to be run by PS Framework in the background. So if you now have a secured environment where you allow PS Framework, any attacker could use an untrusted code of an untrusted function. Since this is going to be transported as a string, this function would be loaded as a trusted function in the background. At which point, um, well, you would have an escalation of, well, code trust, which we don't want. So if you um, uh, have to work with secure environments, don't provide a string. You can also provide a script block of the function in a constrained language mode, language mode environment, even if you set PS Framework as trusted, it is going to reject any string-based function definitions. It is only going to accept a script block, and that script block must be trusted. No constrained language mode script block. So we've got those two. Define that. Add the run space worker, which is going to call the function. And it's done. Remove it all. And finally, we have our results. So this is how we could create this whole thing if we know that our function definition is actually safe. Modules, same thing, same story. We just provide the module name, module path, whatever, depending on whether we have an explicit path or it's an installed module and it's going to be pre-provisioned. And go. There we are. Next, we have this, uh, this scenario, how the hell do I implement this with, um, if I've got one long running command as the input, I don't have any actual input values, I've got this get mailbox that is going to return 100,000 mailbox and I need to process them as they come in. We have again a slow command to simulate this. And provide that. And in this case, we pipe the result of the command to write piece of run space queue. This is going to be a bit more user friendly for uh, the next part is because of how the parameter sets work and how the command resolution happens, um, which is why I need to explicitly bind them to null. It's, that one's going to be more convenient. And here's one more parameter. If we want to stop the run space workflows, even if, even if it didn't complete, what happens behind the scenes is that we are waiting until the current item is, co is completed and then just don't process more items on the input queue of a worker. Problem is this 
doesn't complete. It's going to wait until it's got all of the mailboxes, all of the numbers, all of the anything. So for workers that we can't wait for, we kill, need to set the switch kill to stop, so it's then going to just kill it. Again, with some subsequent call, adding some items here. And then we can start the workflow. And can theoretically watch the items as they happen. I did test all of the bloody demos, sorry. My mess up. Yeah, there's a few more details there. Any questions about this whole thing? Anything you want me to go more deeply into? All right, to repeat the question, let's say we're using RunSpace workflows inside of our own module to parallelize something, and you want to now access commands from that module, especially non-public commands from that module. How easy is that? How non-easy is that? Actually, it's mostly doable. What you need to do in that case is you want to reference two modules. Once your PSD1 file, as a path, and then your PSM1 file as the path. That way, first we will load the PSD1, including things like uh, types to import or whatever else you need in the background run space, and then we do the same thing with the PSM1 to ensure you've got access to the public commands. The alternative to that, if you don't have a problem with doing the dual import call because your module is doing something during the import and you would be doing that twice otherwise, is you could instead do an in-module invoke of your command. You can run non-public commands inside, uh, out from outside of the module. The way to do this is, let's say, what module do we have here? Currently loaded, come on, there we go. Let's take piece framework here. I can call with the, use the call operator and define a command I want to run. What I can also do first is use get module and the command name to specify the context in which I want to run this. So if I now, let's do something simple. I'm just going to search for all commands from the module PS framework. It is now going to give me the list of all the commands, including the non-public ones. But well, soon as it's actually doing something, there it is. Now this also, for example, includes a write piece of config file, which is not a public command. It's an internal one, which is something I can detect here because of the casing of the command. Otherwise, I couldn't remember all of them. And with that, you could instead have here any internal commands, and they would run. Any other questions? All right. In that case, let's continue on with um, another aspect that we have completely ignored so far. And that is sometimes we need to do something only once per thread. Let's say I need to connect first then do all of my executions, and finally, once my, once my step is completely done for each of the iteration, I'm closing this. Let's say I have a worker that receives 1,000 input items. I don't want 1,000 times to connect to Exchange Online, do my thing and disconnect again. Peace Framework workflows have that handled by having begin, process, and end blocks that I can also provide to the worker with begin, script block is the equivalent to process always, and end. Since I don't actually have a SQL server at hand to um, demonstrate that, this is more like for reference, an example on how that would work. 
if your worker says, I'm going to uh, execute um, three times in parallel, it is going, for each of these three parallel executions, going to do the begin first, then do all of the actions needed, and it's going to do the end. If you run stop PSF run space workflow, it's also going to wait for the last process item and going to do to the end. So you don't leave any hanging sessions open there unless you have the kill to close switch set. To pass variables between them, as you can see, you will need the global variable prefix. You need to specify this in the global scope because they otherwise don't see each other. Throttling. Throttling works mostly the same way as you did see right now because I literally extracted the code from PS Framework, which is why this was a bit more lengthy from the total code. We have a command called new PSF throttle, which is going to give you exactly the same object you previously saw as uh, C sharp code that we didn't go into. It's working the same way, and we've got a parameter to apply this. So in this case, the first command is going to run unthrottled. The second one is going to apply the throttle, which says only five per three seconds. And we add 20 items that we want to do in Q1, which is the input queue. Then we execute everything and wait until it's done. And we will be seeing all the throttling timestamps that have applied that rule. I hope. Step completed. Collect the data, remove the run space workflow, and here's our results. And we can see that the first items were basically created, uh, spawned immediately, there were no throttling involved. The second stage, however, after five items, decided to wait because we ran into the throttling limits. Wait until works exactly the same way we saw before. If the not before, the problem is our parallelized code needs access to that and we don't have any dollar throttle variable passed in. We could be using that, but there is also a way around that. And that is you have an automatic variable in the background run space representing the worker which has the throttle, and we have the not before property. And that's going to, again, have us wait until the not before has expired. Completed here, got the results, and we have that one 10 second jump in between where we had the not before. And well, that's it. That's pretty much the run through through the one space workflows. I designed that. Any questions? Anything you want to see? Shall we have a few more minutes? Well, Do we have a race conditions when it, uh, previously when we manually set up the queues and the, um, the status tag? Um, no, we don't. The item itself is designed for parallel access, so within a single uh, run space, a concurrent dictionary or concurrent queue, we don't have any access problems. And the other part, which made the whole thing possible, um, is that we only check the status if we no longer get got anything from the queue. So if we first queue the last item and then set the status, in that case, the subsequent worker cannot hit this position unless it dequeued that item correctly. Hypothetically, hypothetically, we could actually have a race condition. However, that would require that I manage to do both of these steps in um, 
that in between those two steps, the other run space managed to do both of them at the same time. And that's statistically not probable from a processing cost perspective. It's uh, not 100% guaranteed, yes. You would need to, you could need add an explicit sleep in there to ensure that. Uh, otherwise, the alternative to that is that we build our own class that with a lock that um, makes both actions um, a safe transactional setting, and in which case we could avoid that. Uh, in fact, that is uh, more or less what I did with my custom queues with the closed flag. What's happening behind the scenes, I have created my own custom concurrent queue, which inherits from the native concurrent queue and added additional properties, including the state of uh, whether it's closed or not, and uh, whether it's uh, how many items have ever been added to it. So I can do the tracking properly. And in, in those cases, I overwrote the default methods to ensure the scheduler. Well, if nobody's got any more questions, thank you for coming. You know where to find me if you have any follow-up thoughts, questions, opinions, feedback, um, or want to talk about anything else PowerShell. I think I've well established that it's a lot easier to get me started than stop talking about it. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, and looking forward to later.